Louisiana College. And
These are all college students at Louisiana College, so if you have a pizza card to give them on their way out, they would much appreciate that. What a blessing. Thank you for using your talents to, to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and bless our hearts today. Today we have Dr. Rick Brewer, president of Louisiana College, coming today to present our message to us. Dr. Brewer. It's great to be with you today. <clears throat> Trust you're doing well. And um, thank you, singers from the college, from Louisiana College. I tell you, that's, that's good, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that about get a Baptist to shouting. <laughs> yeah. now, they didn't tell you where they're from. Now, they're from Homa, Walker, Lafayette, or as, uh, as she calls it, Walker. Is that the way you pronounce it, right? Is that the right way? Close. And then uh, from Gina, and from Pineville, Alexandria, and let's see, Jordan, where are you from? Where? 
Perry, Prairieville, okay. And Morgan City. Don't forget Morgan City. That's, that's right. Yeah, so uh, they're all majoring in different subjects, and uh, they do this. They go out every Sunday and, and sing for the Lord and represent the school, and I get to go along with them every now and then. John, I get the honor of preaching after that. You know, there have been a couple of churches where the pastors about fought me. And you know, the host guy said, I'm going to preach today instead. It's <laughs> okay. But uh, what a joy to be with you. Thank you as a church for praying for Louisiana College. Continue to pray for her and for how God is blessing there for our faculty, our staff, our students. Uh, thank you for investing in her with your prayers as well as with your gifts through the cooperative program. The gifts that we've been doing as Baptists since 1925 bringing our monies together for missional purposes at home and abroad. And let me tell you, Louisiana College is a mission field. I mean, our faculty, our staff, our coaches, our Christians, our professing Christians, they live out their faith. A critical mass of our students are followers of Christ, but we're definitely a mission field. There are students there who need to know Jesus, and we're glad they're there. And they hear the gospel every week in chapel. They hear it and see it in the classroom. Uh, they see it before them, on and off the playing fields. And so we're definitely a mission field because there may be students there who want to major in nursing or teacher ed or business or convergence media or any of our other programs we have. And, you know, they're okay that it's a church school. They're okay it's Christian. They want to play in a sport. But uh, just like a couple of weeks ago in chapel, seven students prayed, came forward in front of their peers and said they want to follow Jesus Amen. as their Lord and Savior. And so, you know, that's, that's why we're there. You know, I'll, sometimes I'll hear from people about maybe a student or two who misbehave, and they'll go, I can't believe people do that at Christian college. I said, well, have you checked out some of the behavior of the people in your church lately? <laughs> I can't believe they do that either. But <laughs> was that cutting too close there, just a little too close? But, you know, I mean, you know, people that don't know the Lord, uh, unregenerated people do what unregenerated people do. And so I'm glad they're with us and not some other place where they'll hear the gospel of Jesus. And they'll learn about forgiveness. They'll learn about how he can give them a new life, a new start, and how he's the one who has, wants to set their, their trajectory and give them a destiny. So thank you for supporting us, sending students our way. Continue to do that. I'd love to say that next year this time that we've got a young person singing in this group from Ville Platte. That'd be great, huh? So uh, you help us do that. And my, that, that, that opening group, your, your worship team, wow, oh, they're not tremendous. That was awesome. I enjoyed that immensely. Um, we need a fiddle player, so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I guess that's violin, excuse me. But uh, anyway, it was good. It was good. You guys keep that up, okay? How many of you are Louisiana College alums? And all the others wish you were? Okay. Um, <laughs> How many of you have children that are? Yeah, I know some of you. I know some met. No, good. And uh, so thank you. I, I've only been to school. I'm in my second year as president. I grew up in the Carolinas. Um, in fact, I was born in New Orleans when my folks were in seminary. And then dad pastored churches in the Carolinas. Of course, I grew up as a PK, a preacher's kid. So we have many PKs here today. We have a few PKs, some up here. Well, you know why the PKs, did ever tell you how bad your kids are? You know why PKs are bad? I mean, I was bad. I was really bad. I mean, one night in church, I decided, it was back in the little, little church where they had the hardwood floor and the old pews, and I decided one Sunday night in church, I got bored. I was on the front row, and I decided I was going to crawl under the pews backwards all the way to the back. I just thought that was going to be fun, you know? I was about nine years old, and I got halfway there, and my dad stopped mid-sermon and said, Rick, get your rear end back where it belongs. I'll deal with you later when we get home. But, uh, you know, so the, but the preacher's kids tend to be bad, and that's because we play with the deacon's kids. That's the whole problem. <laughs> but uh, so I grew up in the Carolinas. I was in Charleston for about 28 years where I served at another Baptist institution as vice president before the Lord brought us here to serve. And um, I've got, you know, in my family, I've got uh, a lot of folks in my family that have served the Lord in ministry, like my dad and others have passed away. They're home with the Lord now. And uh, it's down to about me and one cousin who is, I mean, he's retired, in fact. He lives in Nashville. He's a retired pastor. 
The rest of my relatives are just uh, you know, a bunch of reprobates. And uh, no, I'm kidding. But uh, in particular, one cousin, Vernon, Vernon T. Brewer IV. He's my really good cousin down in Waycross, Georgia. Anybody ever been to Waycross, Georgia? Anybody from there? Good, I can tell this story. Um, you know why they call it Waycross, Georgia, Pastor? Because it's way across Georgia. Uh, it really is. But Vernon was in the Marine Corps. He served his time for his country, a great Marine. He said, don't ever call him an ex-Marine. You're always a Marine if you're a Marine. Some of you here today may have been that. You know what I'm talking about. But he went back home to Waycross to farm. He's a deacon in the church. He's a devoted follower of Christ. And, uh, but anytime something comes across the Internet or television that's religious or gets his uh, interest up, he, he'll call me up and uh, want it because I've become in the family the resident theologian. I mean, I do all our weddings and all our funerals now in the family, it seems like. And so uh, about two, three years ago, I was on an airplane getting ready to leave on the tarmac, about to close the door, so they, you know, got to crank down the cell phones. And I see on my phone Vernon T. come up on the phone. And I said, well, he doesn't call that often. When he does, it's serious. So I took the call. I said, Vernon, I don't have but about a minute to talk. You know, what's going on? He said, well... I had this magazine dropped off at the house, and they had a stick note on it. It said, I'll be by to see you soon and talk about it. I said, well, what's the name of the magazine? He said, it's called The Watchtower. I said, well, Vernon, let me just tell you about it. I don't have long to tell you, but the folks who produce that publication, there are a lot of things we don't agree about in Scripture. And I knew this would get his attention in the few seconds I had left. And Vernon, one thing I've heard, I don't know if it's true, but I've been told that they're not patriotic at all. They don't believe in pledging allegiance to the flag, singing a national anthem. They don't believe in anything. But he said, that's enough for me. Click. So about, oh, seven, eight days later, this nice lady drives up in a minivan, pulls up in the driveway, gets out with a briefcase, comes around to the front door, rings the doorbell. Vernon says to Marianne, his lovely wife, Paul, the nice person is here. Let's let them in to talk. So they let her in, and there's Marianne and Vernon. They're three little girls. Their three little girls are 12, 10, and 8, and they're really beautiful, and they sing, and they do all kind of, they're a really great family. Well, as the lady gets in the house, she says, oh, thank you for letting me come in and speak with you today. So I just got a few things here I want to share with you. Let me get them on my briefcase. And he says, ma'am, just a minute before you do that. We just want you to know that it's customary in our family that anytime we have anyone new, any guest, that we always pledge allegiance to the flag. <laughs> and so they had a wonderful American flag right there over the fireplace, you know, and they walked over to the fireplace and they put their hands over their heart and they did the pledge. And they did that with joy and glee, loudly. They finished. The lady said, oh, let, let me get to what I can. Oh, ma'am, just a minute. I want you to know that our family is so patriotic that every day, together, we sing the national anthem. In fact, we don't just sing one verse, we sing all three verses. And so 11 minutes later, he looks at a nice lady and says, Now, ma'am, what is exactly you came to talk to us about? What's in that briefcase? She says, Sir, all I want you to know is that, you know, in my 23 years of selling Avon, I've never... Never met a family as patriotic as this one, that's for sure. So, so Vernon, Vernon was ready. He just the uh, wrong, wrong person, but he was ready. So, so pray, pray for Cousin Vernon, would you? My formative years were in North Carolina in my early years, and uh, that's where I learned to love about three things in North Carolina, basketball, barbecue, and golf, because Lord knows we can't play football there, so we had to learn to love basketball. But... Uh, not well, at least. So, uh, but in the, in the seventh grade, back in the days of the junior high schools, I was in Lee County Junior High in the seventh grade. And they brought us all towards the end of the year, and they, they would separate us, the guys in one place, the girls in the other. And they had these movies. We don't call them videos. We didn't know the word video back in those days. It was the old big old movie thing, and it would break in the middle, and the teacher would always have to splice it and tape it right in the middle. I know I'm giving my age away, but you know what I'm talking about. It was back in the day when they didn't have these old rock stars to give you all these slogans and you didn't have all these fancy promo stuff about kids, don't do this, don't do that. It was more in your face, we're going to get your attention. 
So the first movie they brought us in to see had to deal with the dangers of drinking alcohol. And so we're sitting there watching this movie. We're all about 13 years old. And in the movie, there's a party going on at some kid's house. And everybody's having a good time, jumping around, doing all the things they do at parties. And all of a sudden, one fella goes to the back room, and he decides to invade his parents' case where they kept their alcohol. And so he's beginning to drink and drink and drink. He gets drunk. He gets sick. He passes out. They call, the, you know, they call for help. An ambulance comes, picks him up. They take him to the hospital. They put tubes up his nose, needles in his veins. His mom and daddy come to the hospital, and they cry. And we thought the moral of that story was, don't ever drink, because if you do, they're going to stick tubes up your nose, needles in your veins, your mom and daddy's going to cry. <laughs> so we were so convicted after watching that movie that we would bypass even the water fountain that day. <laughs> Nothing. And it was about, a, about a two weeks later, they brought us back in to see another movie, Pastor. In this movie, it was The Dangers of Drugs. Again, it's a party at this kid's house. You know, it took me a while to figure out. It was about a couple years later, I realized it was the same people in both movies. But anyway, so in this particular movie, in this particular movie they got the party going on. All of a sudden, the guy goes to the back room, and he begins to, you know, participate in illegal drugs. So he passes out. They call the hospital. The ambulance comes and picks him up. They take him to the hospital. They put tubes up his nose, needles in his veins. His mom and daddy come to the hospital, and they cry. We thought the moral of that story was, don't ever do drugs. If you do, you're going to pass out. They're going to stick tubes up your nose, needles in your veins, your mom and daddy going to cry. I mean, we were so convicted after watching that movie that we would never do drugs that if I had a headache, I wouldn't even take a baby aspirin. I mean, you know, it may lead to that, seriously. And then there was the final thing they did that um, they would never, ever do this again. I mean, this was, looking back, this was abusive (laughs) to all of us. They brought us into this room in a tray. It was the lung of a man, I think, who had smoked camel cigarettes for 50 years. And so he had died of lung cancer, and there was his lung in the tray. And we all had to touch it. (laughs) Yeah, touch it. I mean, you know, now you're seriously convicted. You ain't ever smoking. You ain't ever doing anything. And we all figured the the moral of that story was kids don't ever smoke because one day if you do, little boys and girls in the seventh touch your lung. (laughs) We ain't going to do that. But here's what happened. You know, walking out of there, it was so easy to be convicted about it. But yet we really weren't because it was no time whatsoever that, you know, people had tried all those things. I'm thankful I never tried the drugs or the alcohol. I did the smoking part because I grew up around tobacco farms and you didn't have much choice, it seemed like. But uh, gratefully, thankfully, I quit that and didn't pursue that any further. But I had buddies who, by the time in high school, had, uh, had died of overdose. Others been killed in accidents due to the influence of alcohol or drugs. And so we, it was very easy for us to form a conviction in that moment, but yet over time, over time it slipped away. We weren't really committed. We weren't really all in. I mean, it's the same reason that our pastor can stand up here week after week after week and say, we need to be men and women of prayer. We go, man, that's right, pastor. Amen, brother, you're right. We walk out the door, shake his hand, say, boy, I'm going to commit more time to prayer this week than I ever have in my life. And then we go out, and we don't change the way we do that. We don't change our behavior. We have a conviction here, but it's hard out there. And the same reason a pastor will stand and say, you know, we need to be telling people about how Jesus has changed our life, sharing with others the gospel, the good news of Christ. Oh, amen, preacher, we applaud, we walk out. That's the best sermon we've ever heard on that. And we don't change and do anything different. It's the same reason that some of us will hear a message about how we need to spend time with our kids. Fathers, you need to spend time with your children. Love on your children. You only have them for just a, a period of time. Love them, lead them, pour into their lives. Well, oh, amen, Pastor, that's the best sermon I have ever heard on being a daddy. And we walk out of here, and we don't change our behavior. Same reason he'll preach a message on how husbands and wives to love each other, to serve one another, to work problems out together, to learn to love Christ together. And the more you love Christ together, the more you love each other together. And what an example you are to your children and to others 
Oh, Pastor, that is the best sermon I've ever heard on marriage, the best sermon I've ever heard on a family. And some of us will walk out and won't change anything. It's because it's very easy for us to form it in the moment. We easily form preferences, but we have very few convictions. Well, let me give you just some working definitions to help you understand the difference, and I want a biblical application. A preference is based on emotion. You know, when we touched that lung, we were pretty emotive with that. We, got, we felt that. When we saw the movies, we felt that. Just like you can get emotional in here when you hear a message. When you hear the testimony of these songs, you can get very emotional about it. But a conviction is based upon a principle. Principles don't change. Emotions change. A preference is oriented towards the here and now. What's going on in the environment around me right now? Because in this room, it's very easy to be a Christian, right? It's very popular to be a Christian in this room. Out there, it's not easy. Out there, I have news for you, it's not popular anymore. But a conviction is oriented towards the future, and it asks this fundamental question. Where will I be five years, yea, even ten years from now if I continue to practice this sort of behavior? If I continue to follow this world view? If I continue to act in this way? If I continue to think in this way? If my attitude continues in this way? Where will that lead? That's what a conviction asks about our, about our marriages, our families, our relationship to others. Where will it be if I continue in this pattern? And the third thing is a preference is influenced by what others think. Uh, you know, peer pressure is huge. Peer pressure isn't just about teenagers. Peer pressure is upon us all the time. And so we're always concerned about how others view us, how others think, but yet a conviction is concerned with what God thinks. What a difference. A preference is for what everybody else is for, but a conviction asks this question, what is pleasing to God? What is pleasing to God? What is God for? What can I change about my behavior that makes God happy, that pleases God? You know what we do as believers is we justify our behavior. Yes, we justify our sin by thinking that God just kind of measures this on a curve, on the sin curve. You remember curves in in high school and college? You were so grateful when you made a 78 and the teacher came in and said, I'm going to curve the grade up, and that became a B. Right? And so we think, well, you know, there's people in this world doing far worse things than this. So, you know, it must be okay for me to do this. I mean, it's like the, like the kids one time who asked me, a Christian student once asked, he said, how far can I go <laughs> in, in physical relationship with my girlfriend and not sin? I said, well, I think you've gone already pretty far by just asking that question. <laughs> no. But yet we think, well, you know... This is what the world's doing. I hear it in the music. I see it on the television, in the commercials, in the movies, and everywhere. It's, we're bombarded with it. We think, you know, it's okay if no. No, God doesn't grade like that. Sin is sin is sin. A preference is abandoned for the sake of immediate pleasure. But a conviction is regarded as a means of attaining true success and joy. A preference is convenience-oriented. A conviction is sacrifice-oriented. There are a lot of stories in God's Word that would illustrate this fact today. Because we see this as a thread through all of God's Word. That He's always looking for men and women of conviction, of character, of conscience, of consistency. Yes, men and women of integrity. God raises those men and women to levels of influence in their world, in their culture, in their community, in their church in their schools, in the marketplace. He, God, raises them to a level of influence. Why? To impact the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I get that thing backwards. I'm prone to in the flesh. We all are. I say, God, if you know, if you just get that famous coach over there saved, if you just get that famous entertainer, that famous singer, that movie star, that politician, my goodness, think of the influence they could have. Well, that may be true, but that's not the way God works. God looks for men and women in this room. God looks for men and women on the campus of Louisiana College. He looks for men and women everywhere who be men and women of principle, of character, of conscience, of consistency, of conviction. Not preference-oriented, but conviction. And he, God, raises them to a level of influence. We see it here in Daniel. 
In Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. I want to look at that verse and a couple verses over in chapter 3. In Daniel 1, 8, I'll just give you the context here. This is a period of time of captivity for the Israelites. And Nebuchadnezzar was his style as he would go in and raid communities and towns. He would find and extract who he thought were the brightest of the bright. And so he had brought back to Babylon the leaders he assumed to be leaders of the Jewish community. He brought back the mathematicians and the scientists and the musicians and the artists and the people who had special talent and skill. And he brought them together and he said, I am going to change their worldview. I'm going to inculcate them with the worldview of the Babylonians, which believed in multiple gods. They did not believe in Jehovah God. And so he thought, if I could change the dial, if I could change the worldview, it's what, ladies and gentlemen, happens to our young people when they go off to our public colleges. Just, just, a, just a word there. It's the truth. As opposed to a Christian school like LC and others, where the worldview that we're teaching is a biblical worldview, it's a thread through every academic curriculum. When a professor in biology or a professor in Christian studies, a professor in education, a professor in business are all leading us to the fact that we look through and beyond the created order and discover and identify for our students the Christ-centeredness in everything, that's not what they do at the schools we support with our tax dollars. And I kind of shouldn't expect them to. I wish they would, but they don't. But this is, what, this is what Nebuchadnezzar was tempted. Well, there's one guy there named Daniel who said, not going to do it. Not the way. He says, Daniel, this is the way you should, you should eat. This is the diet you should follow. And in Daniel's mind and heart, it wasn't so much the, the diet plan that was being offered to him that was the sin. What was a sin to Daniel, what was an issue of conviction to Daniel was the fact that these items had been offered and blessed by the gods of the Babylonians. That was the big issue. He's in a foreign land. He's an alien. No one would know he's there, would they? No one would know the decision he made. He makes a decision that ultimately could cost him his life because that's what the king says. We'll check you out in two weeks. If you're not doing well, but Daniel knew there was one person really watching. The God who he loved, the God who he served. And to him, this is a big deal. Listen to what he says in Daniel 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You see, Daniel drew a line in the sand. Daniel made up his mind that he would serve God and no other. Let me ask you a question today. What have you made your mind up about? What is it in your life? What is it that up, that's up for stake? What is it? It might be a personal issue, a personal decision. It might be a relational issue. It might be an issue with, with your family. It might be an issue with your marriage. You, know, you may have walked an aisle at one time and said, till death do we part. For good, for bad, for better, for worse. We're going to love. We're going to cherish. We're going to hold the fidelity of this family, this marriage. And yet maybe today... Today is not like it once was. Today you may be thinking, I don't love him or her anymore. And I'm looking for a way out. I mean, if 50% of the marriages that fall apart in America fall apart in our churches, and it mimics the same percentages as those that are unbelievers, we wonder why unbelievers aren't listening to the church anymore on some of the great moral issues of our day. Because we haven't modeled it. And so you may be thinking that way today, and I say that's, not, that's, that's where preference is leaking in. And let God bring that back and work that back in your marriage and in your relationship. And let God have control again and seek him together. I, I've never heard of a couple that fell apart that if you ask them how was their spiritual life, they both said, oh, it's the best it's ever been. No. And I do recognize, I do recognize that there are just some situations that are irreconcilable. I do recognize what the Bible says in certain situations where there just needs to be. It's abusive or where there's been infidelity and those things. If it's beyond what God can work out, then you have to do, obviously, what's best for you and your family. But I know what his best is. His best is that we would honor him and be true and faithful and understand he's the one that's watching and looking. So, Daniel, this is a big deal. He's drawn a line in the sand. 
And he says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to cross over there. So what is in your life? What moral issue? What ethical issue have you said? No matter what's it cost, no matter the fact that no one may be looking, I, I'm going to do that. Well, the story continues. Because of Daniel's commitment and because after two weeks he's in better shape than the guys who followed the Babylonian diet plan, he has now earned the right to be heard. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar's cluing in there's something special about this guy, and he gives him a place of leadership. You see what God's doing? A man of character, a man of conviction. He's a nobody. He's a stranger in a strange land. He's really a prisoner. And because of his conviction, his commitment, because he's sticking to what he believes, even Nebuchadnezzar, a man not after God's heart, sees something unique and different and raises him to a level of influence. And it's there that he says, hey, I got some buddies of mine who I think you need to get to know. They're great leaders too. And there we see the three guys we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the names Nebuchadnezzar gave them. And we see the story. So the story moves forward in chapter 3 where now Nebuchadnezzar has got a big problem, big problem. He has pluralism to the max. Because he's brought in all these people from all of his world around him that represent multiple religions. And he's getting a little bit concerned. And so he says, okay, I'll tell you what. You you do whatever you want to do. You kind of worship whatever you want to worship. But when you hear the royal band play, and it's right outlined there in chapter 3. When you hear the band play, when you hear them play the music of the king, you stop whatever you're doing, you hit your knees, and you pay homage, you, you worship the graven image that was erected for him, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. That's pretty big. So you got to do it. Well, the first time, you know, it happens, many and everyone do that, except these three fellows, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think maybe some of the guys observed that and let it slide, and it, you know, then it happens again. So some fellow reports them to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar brings them in for a confrontation. He says, guys, didn't I tell you, didn't you get the rules? You understand? I mean, you can worship your God when you want to. That's fine. But when you hear the royal band play, you hit your knees and you worship the God of me. And listen to their response. Shadrach, in verse 16 in chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. Aren't you thankful the God you serve is able? Is he able to save you personally? Is he able to save your family? Is he able to save your marriage? Is he able to save your future? Absolutely. Amen? You can trust him. But watch this. This is the line of demarcation. But this is cutting between the men and the boys right here. He says, the God we serve is able to save us, but... And he will rescue us from your hand, verse 18. But even if he does not... If he does not what? If he does not what? If he doesn't save us. If we die... In the blazing furnace. We got news for you, king. We're still doing the right thing. We're still following and serving God. We're trusting God. Because either way, if you get rid of us, we're going to be in his presence. Either way, it's all good. He said, but listen, the God is able, the God we serve is able, but even if he doesn't, I want you to know, king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. We're not going to bow. We've counted the cost. Now, these guys were a little different, Pastor. They were somebody because of Daniel's faithfulness, remember. They are brought up to a level of influence. They now have something. They got a lot on the line. They got a lot at stake. You know, they're probably earning a fantastic income by this point in time. They got major leadership responsibility in the kingdom there. And they're going to lose it all because they're men of conviction. Oh, that God would raise up more men and women of conviction in our churches, in our communities, in our leadership. It's been been the problem of America for years. People that just have bought into political correctness, 
not willing to stand, not really have anything to stand on because in this postmodern world we live in now in America where there is no absolute truth, at least that's what the world says, the worldview, the worldview that's a secular worldview that believes that whatever you think is true is fine, whatever you think is true is fine. It's all situational ethics. No objective truth, no transcendent truth, no moral truth which has been the fiber that's held this country together since its founding. Oh, that we would come back to that. But here are men of conviction. They've counted the cost. And so they're thrown into the fiery furnace. It's so hot that even the guys that work for the king who toss them in are exhumed. And so the king's going down. Nebuchadnezzar's going down a little bit later. He wants to see how his, you know, char-grilled Hebrew boys look. And he goes down and he sees something unusual. They're not three, they're four, and they're having a party. They're having a worship service. God came down. God came down and invaded and visited their place. He was with them in, through the fire. You ever been in the fire? I don't mean a physical fire. I hope you don't have to go through that. But how about a fire in your personal life? How about some tough news? How about fire in your personal life? How about fire in your marriage, in your family? To know that he is with you, in it, through it, and on the other side. So the king, his heart's changed. He says, wait a minute, their God is real. (laughs) Get those boys out. And so they get the guys out of the fiery furnace. And I love the Bible when it tells us this clearly. You don't miss this point. It said they did not even smell like smoke. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can go in a restaurant that still has a smoking section on the rear end. I don't know what it is. You still come out smelling like smoke. I don't know what it is about that. I mean, to imagine, it's as if God just put a protective bubble around them. Because, you see, it reminds me again (laughs) that he is holding me in his hand. You see, it's it's, it's this way, because if it's this way, if I'm holding God, there's many times that I have not been a faithful person, and so have you, right? right? If it was dependent upon me, but because God has control of me, and I might try to let go, and say, no, you're mine. The Holy Spirit speaks to our heart, reminds us to be men and women of conviction and not preference, and keeps us. And seals us to that day. Well, I don't know what's at stake in your life. I don't know. But here's what I do know. If you continue to be a man or woman of preference instead of conviction. If you continue to be just concerned about what others think. If you're only considered concerned about the here and now. If you're only concerned about, you know, basically if it feels good, do it. If you're only concerned about that and not living as a man or woman of principle, of character, of conscience, of integrity, of consistency based on God's word. Living for the future. If you're not doing that, that life will end in destruction. Now, James says that. Even for the believer. And if you don't, if you continue to be a man or woman of preference, it may cost you not only your life, but it may cost you your children. I'll tell you why. Listen, our kids will hear about living a life of conviction and character and and all that in church, right? They'll hear about it here. They're definitely going to hear about it. They're going to hear about the good news of salvation here. But where they watched it lived out is at home. Where are they going to see a man or woman who says, I have counted the cost. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to serve God. I'm willing to do that which it may cost me, but yet I know it's what God intends to do. They'll hear about it here. They'll see it at home. So if you continue to be a man or woman of preference, you may lose your kids. Well, that's terrible, but that's not the worst thing. And if you continue to be a man or woman of preference as opposed to a man or woman of conviction, you may lose your marriage. You may lose your spouse. Why? Because sure as God has a plan for your marriage. Let me tell you who else has one. Satan. Diabolos, deceiver, the slanderer. I've conducted a lot of weddings through the years. I've worked with college students for 35 years. And so I've, I've had the opportunity to conduct a lot of weddings. You know, every time I conduct a wedding... 
I've conducted a lot of weddings of my former students and my own sons. I did their weddings. And in all those weddings, I've always said, there's nothing easier in this moment, in this place, than to say, I do and I will. It's easy right now. You're expected to do it. Now, I've had a few guys, not girls, but I've had a few guys pass out, you know. I did one wedding where the old fellow was an offensive lineman, big fella, and beautiful young lady. She laughed the whole way. He cried the whole way. I don't know what was going on, but they're still together. It's all good. But I said, you know, nothing easier than saying, I will, I do, forever and ever, amen. No, it's lived out out there. And I tell every one of them, Pastor, you have to decide every day when you get up, I want to be married. I want to be married. I want this to work. I want this to honor God. So if you continue to be a man or woman of preference about your marriage, it, it will end. It will lo- you will lose it. Well, that's bad. That's not the worst thing. Let me tell you the worst thing is this. The worst thing is that if we continue to be men and women of preference as opposed to being men and women of conviction, we miss out on ever being fully used by God and that's the worst thing that can happen they did not know the future they did not know the implications for the decisions they made they did not know how God was going to change the trajectory of their lives they did not know that today some 2,000 plus years we're still talking about them because there were a lot of men marched out of Jerusalem on that day and taken as strangers and prisoners to a far land and we don't remember a single name but we remember the name of these four because they were men of conviction men of character men of conscience men of integrity and God used them you don't know I don't know I don't know what's at stake in your life. I don't know what God wants to do in you. But I do know this, that the minute I act as a man or woman of preference, I short circuit. I short circuit what God wants to do in my life. Who wants to go there? But beyond losing your children, losing your marriage, losing, that's the worst thing that could happen. You could miss out on ever being fully used of God. Because he has, as Paul says, he wants to do amazing things beyond we could ever imagine or think out there. He wants to do it. He's just waiting on a man or woman. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your abilities or whatever. He's just waiting on a man or woman to say, I want to be that man. I want to be that woman of conviction. I've counted the cost. I've drawn the line in the sand. I want to be that man or woman of integrity, consistency, character. And I'm available, God, for you to take me and place me. Levels of influence. You know, it might be influential in the workplace. Wouldn't that be great? Maybe levels of influence in your community. It may be levels of influence in politics. It may be levels of influence... In education. My youngest son, who's a banker, he's he's uh, he's loved the Lord a long time. He um, Jonathan has always had a heart, soft, tender heart for people. Always thought maybe God was going to call him to preach, and he still may. He's only he's thirty, but he loves the the business world and the banking world. And he was working for a large corporate bank about three or four years ago. And as corporate banks will do, they go through changes and transitions, and they decide to lay off a significant part of the workforce. He'd only been working for them for two years, the youngest junior banker there. He didn't lose his, his job, I think partly because he's, you know, God was blessing him. He's walking in fellowship with the Lord, and he's a good worker. But he said, he called me up that day, said, Dad, it was just bad news here today. He said, it was interesting, Dad, that uh, everybody in the bank who's being laid off came to see me and asked me to pray for them. And I know John doesn't go around as a banker carrying his Bible. Well, he does, because it's right there. It's right there. That's what will happen, folks. You're living for Christ. You're living for him. You're a man of conviction, a woman of conviction. 
you'll be, the people be drawn to you. And oh, that you be there. We need salt. We need light everywhere. That's why I'm excited why I stay and have been in Christian higher education all these 30 plus years. Because what an amazing opportunity to equip young minds to be leaders in every culture shaping venue, to go out and be salt, to be light, to be able to transform culture in different cultures for the cause of Christ. That's our purpose, that's what we do. Let me pray with you this morning as we conclude. Lord, we thank you for your word which never returns void. Thank you for this powerful example. Lord, this isn't made up. This isn't just a little story. This is truth. This is history. This is how you blessed and you showed up and showed out. How, Lord, you were able to change a world, change a worldview, change the heart of a king, change a culture. And, Lord, you're just waiting on that one, two, three, four, five men or women, even in this room today, to say, I, I've counted the cost. I know you're able to save, but even if you don't, God, even if for some reason you choose not, I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to be a man or woman of convenience and preference. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. For the pastor.